Hi, everyone. This is Jason Barrick of Wall Street for Main Street. Welcome back to another Wall Street for Main Street podcast interview. I'm delighted to have my special guest back for another interview. She is the founder of Leduc Capital and Leduc Trading. She also created a small technology company, grew it for 10 years, and sold it in 2008. And she's been actively trading and investing since. Samantha Leduc, thank you for joining me again. Thank you so much, Jason. So, Samantha, we're recording this interview on Wednesday, February 28th, 2024. The dollar index is at 103.94, 10 year US Treasury yield at 4.27%. It's been a roller coaster the last six to eight months. And Nvidia stock is up to $776 a share. Absolutely insane. I've been seeing, <laughs> I, I've heard the just the craziest comments from supposed financial professionals on business television the last couple weeks that there is no bear case for Nvidia. Uh Nvidia is cheap on all the fundamentals and cash flow metrics. Do you think that there's a technology bubble developing here with a small select handful of some of these technology stocks like NVIDIA, ARM, and SMCI? All right. So <laughs> um, if I look at last year's NASDAQ advance, which was you know up 40, uh, 54% you know, from uh, the lows in January, and we did have a reason for it. The January effect turned into the bank backstop in March 2023. And obviously, as a result of that kind of coordinated um, Treasury, Fed, White House, uh, bank backstop, it created some loose mon monetary uh, and financial um, policies that allowed, and of course, we know um, NASDAQ loves loose monetary policy, so does Bitcoin, by the way. Uh, it allowed the market to really recover and start to move higher. And then NVIDIA's May earnings report, which was hot fire flames. And a lot of it is, you know, expectation pulling forward future growth in generative AI, but also their margins really, right? 75, 80%. Um, very, very excited uh, concentration risk in tech took off. And it really stayed that way. So we ended the year in 2023 up 54% in NASDAQ. So to be qualified, quote unquote, as a bubble, uh, similar to what happened in 1999-2000, where NASDAQ actually rose 100% from the trough to the peak in March of 2000. We're not at bubble levels yet. <laughs> so we can go higher. SMCI can go higher. NVIDIA can go higher. The market can go higher. And it was interesting because um, just before we got on the phone, I basically... I took a look to see what was going on with the option market since I'm, you know, macro to micro, but I'm absolutely using um, the market structure of options to identify where big money is positioning. And believe it or not, 30 million in out of the money, 100, I'm sorry, out of the money calls for April just came in. <laughs> so we're like, we're still YOLOing. Um, and SMCI, for example, had a dramatic advance, right? 285% um, uh, explosion from the 1st of January. So we're not talking over 10 years. We're talking from January 1st, right, until their recent peak, it was 285%. All of that was near duration, literally option gamma chasing. So there is this uh, forced um, you know, delta action of calls and it forces dealers in to um, buy the underlying. It creates this gamma squeeze. And then when we come into an options expiration date of size, like we had on February, uh, most recently, uh, 15th, which was the um, the, the month, monthly options expiration, you could see that the dealers had to sell out of their stocks as the theta decay on those calls was quickly dropping, and it resulted in a 20% pullback in SMCI. So options are very, very important to the, you know, the underlying momentum of this stock, in, uh, of this tech rally, and specifically in the AI-related uh, names. But I don't think this is... Um, all that we need to kind of focus on. It is exciting. It's pulling forward a lot of demand. There are a lot of sectors and stocks underneath the indices that are actually rising up. So <laughs> is this 1995 or is this 1999? I started asking that question actually in mid-November 
when we started getting this very strong advance in markets, specifically on, on November 14th, when we had CPI and it was very clear that we were having this disinflation clearly um, in rate of change for inflation, not the kind that Main Street measures, by the way, which is all about compounding inflation, but the way that Wall Street measures from that 9.1% in June right, of uh, 2023 into the most recent print, about 3% for the, the headline CPI, we've definitely had, um, quote unquote, this disinflation impulse. But that is really what's fed the market expecting that the Fed, the, 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 for the Fed to cut. So a lot of those cuts have kind of come through because of the November 1st FOMC minutes where they really said they're going to pause. And it also triggered um, the uh, short covering rally when Yellen came out also on November 1st and issued more T-bills or shorter duration than longer duration notes and bonds so that provided more liquidity into the system. So we had the Fed pause, we had the QRA, which is the quarterly refunding announcement on the February 1st. We had the CPI on November 14th. I said February, sorry, November 1st. And then we had the CPI on November 14th. And all of that triggered this massive short covering rally. Then we have, of course, you know, this kind of gamma squeeze and SMCI um, and NVIDIA this year. But it's still, believe it or not, not a technical bubble. We're not 100% off, off, the, off the lows. And now we've got stuff that's actually broadening out and coming up. So we've got biotechs rallying. We've got IPOs rallying. We've got you know small caps treading water, but they look better. <laughs> we've got retail left for dead uh, retail coming up off the bottom, and we've got some you know mid cap tech plays that are absolutely doing better um, and look like they are ready for a run. So long story short, I don't think we're in a bubble yet. I think this actually can still grind higher. Sounds like risk on rather than <laughs> you've seen Bitcoin. I mean, we tagged 64,000 today and then dropped to 59,000. Um, this is pretty expected since we have those price targets back in 2021, right? And we have loose monetary conditions. There's no question about it. Um, so it, this backdrop of Bitcoin as a liquidity tell, um, all the euphoria wrapped into the gamma squeezes of NVIDIA and SMCI with the market that continues to grind higher because there isn't so far a macro trigger to kind of interrupt the flows, meaning the option flows. They continue to buy calls and sell puts, which is very supportive of the market advance. And you had some of the data that adds to that, you have retail investors that are searching how to buy call options. And these are yeah. retail investors that don't have a lot of stock market ex experience. So people, newbies, I would describe them as newbies, but they see the price action for NVIDIA and SMCI and ARM. And so they're researching how to buy call options now. And I'm getting messages from friends who I didn't even know had any, any interest whatsoever in the stock market. <laughs> and they're starting to buy call options. And then um, hedge funds, I think the new hedge fund amount of... Uh, amount of uh, margin and leverage, that's spiking as well. So this is interesting. Um, hedge funds are actually really all bold up. So are CTAs, those kind of price insensitive, price insensitive um, quants that are really very, very, very full on uh, long equities. But it's more than that. We do have, like you just said, the retail joining in on the FOMO, which is that Funds have already joined in. They've already started to deploy capital because they're betting on rate cuts and that lowers the cost of funding. Um, whether or not we get that is another matter. But for right now, there is the combination of funds that are definitely betting on rate cuts, retail that's coming in to the party. Um, we do have some macro. And then, of course, all the Fed liquidity, which has so far been very supportive uh, like I said, the whole fact that the Fed was not only pausing on the first, but then came out in their December FOMC and said, yeah, we we see three cuts in, in 2024. Uh, and the market just, of course, it got ridiculously happy about that as well. We do have some positive macro back uh, tailwinds. It, it isn't just 
the kind of um, manipulation of gamma squeezes and such. We do have uh, some wage growth that has helped consumers absorb these higher prices. In other words, my thesis of July 2023 was uh, uh, wage inflation delayed recession. So I wrote a big piece uh, about that uh, in October of 2021. I wrote a piece that wage deflation ended with COVID. And then I followed up in July of 2020 three that said wage inflation delayed recession and we've had no recession so th the consumers are able to absorb these higher prices keep spending um rate of change and in inflation is falling you know lowering the cost of funding we'll see about that right now the fed funds you know rate is still a very you know um uh, restrictive 5.4%, but because GDP is still very nicely positive, 3.3% annualized, um, actually it was revised to 32 but still that whole backdrop is helping the equity state bid. And then that liquidity that we still have in the system, about 3 trillion still left out there from the, the post-COVID you know, um, lockdown where all that QE came in, right? Handing out checks as well as you know, all the, the cuts, um, just massive, massive fiscal spending, all of that money is still out there sloshing about. So I think the one big change that I saw um, coming into the fall after the Fed pause and what I call the yelling Yahtzee, right, that, that November 1st fateful time when they both came in with guns blazing and supported the market right before we were about to uh, cliff dive, the big, big difference in the economic backdrop as far as data that has been clearly working to the advantage of both the economy and the stock market is also productivity gains. So a lot of people are going to say, oh, that's AI. No, no, that AI is way early. It's just plain and simple. They got used to kind of doing without during COVID, um, supply constraints and labor, you know, um, uh, constraints. Now, a lot of that labor slack has been uh, kind of like uh, mediated. And by the way, a big part of that was because of immigration, um, bad immigration laws, <laughs> however you want to put it. Basically, foreign born um, folks were the largest um, uh, new entrants into this labor market. And that helped, honestly, keep wages from spiraling a lot higher. Anyway, we just had a massive um, productivity gains, and this has really helped corporate earnings. And the fact that the combination of wage growth, so consumers can spend, productivity gains, so corporate earnings can continue to grow, that has supported prices. It has supported wages. It has supported asset prices. And then on top of that, you have AI as this kind of hot theme du jour, right? In the, in the 90s, it what the late 90s, it was the internet. And that drove that real tech bubble of peak to trough 100%. Right now we have AI. So the difference is we have a massively different debt structure, right? So debt to GDP, our fiscal deficit um, is just um, unsustainable in its current form and financing it is unsustainable in its current form, right? At the uh, seven and a half percent. But we have nonetheless this fiscal spending, which is very supportive of equities. So the market doesn't really have anything to fear unless, I mean, anything, it's got lots of things to fear, but I mean, it, it really has to figure out who's going to be the new sheriff in town come the election, right, for the POTUS um, in November, because those policies will impact the fiscal spending. Do we just continue to rise you know, indefinitely um, or will some way they come in and actually start to put some uh, guardrails and parameters um, on that fiscal spending? In which case that would absolutely um, uh, be a headwind uh, to economic growth. So that's that's the big question. Now you're down in DC, what's, what's the feel? What's the temperature? I don't think anyone's talking about cutting government spending at this point. <laughs> no, no, no. For who's going to have, I mean, we, we're so early also in knowing who's going to really have the advantage there um, come election day. We've got some, you know, 
unknowns and then some assumed, you know, Biden policies stay the same. Trump would, you know, change things. But any any sense there on the on the political front, since you're in that, I'm not. Well, I think the average person doesn't understand that almost 80 percent of the U.S. federal government budget is locked in about five years in advance. So, yeah, there's other spending programs here or there and they can increase spending, obviously. But in terms of actually cutting spending, there's not a lot of spending cuts that they can actually do. They can move money from one government agency to another. It's kind of moving around deck chairs on the Titanic, but um, they can't do just like across the board cuts. I mean, I think the average like when a. Uh, a senator or congressman runs for election. Oh, we're going to reform D.C. We're going to change it. We're going to cut all the spending and we're going to do all this. I mean, they actually, when they get to D.C., they realize they can't really do that. And it's been that way for, for decades. Uh, they can't really cut the budget any in meaningful amounts. Uh, but now, like the line item now, Samantha, is interest payments on the debt. Now that's like yes. a top two or three line item. So that's kind of the mess here. So you have all the other stuff that was high levels and growing, not necessarily exponentially. The new one is interest payments on the debt. So so that kind of brings us to where um, th this is very different from the 1990s, and that is we are no longer in monetary dominance, which is where we really can have um, some potential, right, of paying back these monstrous deficits that the federal government is accumulating. Right now, we're in the exact opposite. We're in a we're in a tight, tight, tight spell of fiscal dominance. So it's that fiscal dominance that most economists and analysts are have never experienced before. I mean, unless you grew up in emerging markets <laughs> and could see how currencies were um, devalued and as a result, you know, stock market gains um, looked real, but they really weren't. But the point is we're really in a very different time compared to um, 2000. Uh, were, were, oh, yeah, yeah, the national debt was only a couple trillion or so, it was under 10 trillion, I think, back then. And again, this, it's like we we still had this belief that, um, we could pay it off right through growth, um, but now it's not, it, it's not believed anymore. And one of the reasons why treasuries are not such a great bet is because of many are still living in that time frame where we were under monetary dominance where we could repay our debts. We're not anymore. So um, fiscal dominance is a different beast and the market doesn't know it yet, but it actually creates this headwind to the US dollar. All the new kind of um, you know paradigms of risk off, we're going to go into bonds. Nope, risk parity died with COVID. Uh, risk off, we're going to go into the dollar. No, not so much. We've got actually de-dollarization that is occurring and that's not a terrible thing actually but where local foreign currencies will absolutely trade together versus convert to dollar now you can see more and more of that happening outside of the U for the US um and that's honestly going to help lower our trade deficit it can also you know lead to the government budget deficit shrinking it's not a bad thing but the bigger picture is as the dollar has um, uh, fallen relatively, it makes assets go up. It looks more bullish than it is. So th this is the whole new paradigm that folks aren't really focused on. And um, I think Bitcoin also, my goodness, right? Everyone is excited about Bitcoin. Um, it, it is, to me, still very viable as you know those who need it. Those in need or those in greed but it is absolutely rogue money. It's not real currency. And it is absolutely, I'm going to, you know, obviously get a lot of folks that don't believe with that um, philosophy, but you do. <laughs> I actually think that it is still a mania, right? A, a, a beanie baby holding a tulip would be a good picture of um, how I kind of view the, the Bitcoin mania. It has a purpose for a very small transactional segment of the society. It is never going to be forced on us. Uh, by the government, like, for example, we are, you know, made to pay our taxes in U.S. dollars. We're never going to be made to pay our taxes. We're never going to have the option to pay it in Bitcoin. So the point is, it is very, very purposeful for a small segment of um, the global marketplace, but its transactional value is extremely small, right? So we're, we're talking just tens of billions, 
versus you know seven trillion a day in U.S. dollar transactions, and it's not used in anything. Meaning, it's used to transact, um, to move money from you know one place to another, but it's not used in the creation of goods and services where it's actually adding value, economic value. So I still have you know um, it, you know it's very tradable, absolutely very very tradable, but not really um, uh, replaceable as it relates to uh, bonds or or dollars. But the problem is they are using Bitcoin as like a zero coupon bond, right? U.S. treasuries have lost some value. The dollar is losing value. Um, so those who are betting on the debasement, which is a silly, silly thing to, to bet on, but those who are betting on the devaluation and the debasement of America are going into these kind of fringe um, uh, outlets. So you know, bidding up <laughs> speculative assets because we have a lot of liquidity in the system still. And we have a lot of trouble um, with uh, an unbalanced budget. So well, it's not I also, go away. You're talking about the U.S. economy a lot. I also think from a macro standpoint, there's an additional macro cross currents here. There's a lot of flight capital leaving some other countries like European Union, China. If you're a money manager in some of these other countries, other than the Japanese stock market, which I think is what at a 40 year high on a devalued yen, only the US stock market is doing well. So there's only a couple stock markets that are doing well. You can make a good argument that the rest of the global economy is in a recession already. And there's money, uh, managed money and retail money that's leaving, say, China or European Union is coming to the US. It's not going into US treasuries, as you pointed out. It's going into maybe more risk on stuff like some of these yes. tech stocks or Bitcoin yes. or maybe like short term treasuries or money market funds. Yeah, no, short term treasuries and money market funds for sure. And then, of course, the tech. I mean, we know Swiss National Bank. Um, has their you know balance sheet uh, heavily, heavily invested in U.S. equities and mostly um, the the ones that trade like um, you know like the bonds, right? They they are Apple and Microsoft and Google and such. So the the interesting thing that you were just talking about, rest of the world. I saw an article that the um, uh, Bank of England may sell its whole QE portfolio. <laughs> I want to know who's going to buy it. Who's going to exactly. buy the Bank of England selling? Who's buying? <laughs> I mean, oh my goodness, they're looking for other liquidity tools to replace QE and they're concerned about inflation and, 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 but exactly your point. They printed money like, obviously it was toilet paper. It just, it, it didn't have meaning. It was just um, irresponsible. And we're doing, by the way, a lot of the same thing, but we have a, a, a much, much bigger um, uh, backdrop, right, of uh, economic levers to pull. Nonetheless, anyone who knows financial history, you know, knows that is as, as soon as it would leave the state, right, of their moneyed capital, it, it becomes, uh, it, it, it gets put in circulation. That is how you trigger inflation. So it is a disaster. And one of the reasons why we're, we still aren't there yet um, is all that money that's, you know, uh, then shifted around here in the, the U.S. with repo and the like uh, is still moving from balance sheet to balance sheet, but it's it, whether it be fed to banks or or what have you, money markets, but it's not going into the economy. If it went into the economy, it would be extra, it'd be hyperinflationary. So they don't they're not planning on doing that. But yeah, it was funny, an article that just came up and you were referencing rest of the world. Well, did you see that there's actually an article that came out that the U.S. and China have to have negotiations with emerging markets about sovereign debt default? So the U.S. and China are sitting down at the table with some of these emerging markets because the dollar on a relative basis, the dollar is still relatively strong against a lot of emerging market currencies. Those other currencies have had currency debasement uh, on a relative basis. They've had way worse inflation, debt monetization. So if you're a citizen in one of those countries like Argentina, I think the annual inflation rate is over 200%. Yeah, Malay is cleaning things up a little bit, but the inflation rate is still over 200% per year. I mean, you're not going to hold Argentinian pesos for your savings. And I think that's why um, gold and Bitcoin gold prices outside the United US dollar gold price are doing so well, because there is a lot of flight capital that's leaving those other countries. And then it's ending up in Bitcoin or gold prices or US tech stocks or money market funds here in the United States. 100% can't argue with you. So really my job as, because I'm not a, you know, a macro analog, uh, analyst, um, I use that as a backdrop. I'm actually really focused on how to trade all of this, right? So a uh, big picture where the market's moving on what time frame, 
um, and then setting up what sector, you know, the sectors that are rotating for, uh, you know, select stock picking, watching the options market, positioning, all of that stuff for clients. And it is definitely why it is very, very hard to short um, in fiscal uh, dominance. And whether this is 1995 and we've got a few years of um, outperformance and let's say oversold uh, tech and you know what have you, because we still have lots of money sloshing about, or it's a 1999 top we haven't seen term yet, because again, we haven't really, you know, we haven't really gone parabolic in the market just in select um, speculative assets of the ones we've already mentioned, right? So, but the thing is, shorting this backdrop is not fun. We have also, you know, we talked about de-dollarization a little bit, financial um, fiscal dominance, but we still have tons of financialized engineering going back into NVIDIA talk, right, with the round tripping um, in some of their supplier deals. And we have buybacks galore. So it's not so easy to short the market. I don't think since my you know mid-November um, uh, call that this was very bullish. It wasn't just going to be the two weeks since the FOMC announced a pause and, and, and Yellen announced the Yahtzee of November 1st. We were going to have a continued run higher. It was going to be very, very tough um, to short this market for all the reasons I've already talked about. And now the number one reason to still stay bullish is this kind of the the micro backdrop of options? So I've got higher. I you know I doubled down in mid January and said I still see the Nasdaq the QQQ going to four 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 overshooting to four seventy two. I still see you know spy um, moving higher into uh, March expiration and then we'll see because that's when we get the next QRA report, which is that quarterly refunding announcement at the end of um, of uh, April. So we've got, we've got spring to kind of deal with in a bullish backdrop. But for right now, um, this is kind of, I don't know, set against potential risks of what could interrupt, right? Are we going to get a, a PBOC yuan devaluation? Um, we It's tough to time. It would be a surprise. Uh, is the Bank of Japan going to do anything about normalizing um, its negative interest rate regime? Not likely. <laughs> but the swaps market is actually predicting June. So maybe, you know, that, that that carry trade unwind would get challenged. And that would absolutely put a bid in the U.S. dollar and our 10-year spiking higher. And that would put a direct challenge to these high flying uh, tech and you know equity advance, right? So we need a macro trigger. Are we going to get, oh, this is a big one. I mean, right now anyway, we've had two years of this uh, Russian invasion in Ukraine and that conflict and funding of that conflict. Will the US in any way, shape or form take those confiscated Russian assets and apply them? That would be a huge break in rule of law and term premia would spike, meaning interest rates would spike. So we do have some things to look for. Would we get an oil spike? Nothing yet. Um, it, it, you know, POTUS election, who's going to win? That would definitely do it, but it's kind of further out there. The government shutdown surprise isn't really a, a high probability, and they just kind of conceded this afternoon. So we really don't have a, a known black, gray, or white swan. <laughs> we, 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 but I know what to look for. So long story short, the market will continue to grind higher until it has a macro reason not to. So you're bullish, but you're keeping an eye on the exit. But there are signs, though, we're seeing like some of the smartest people, the insiders at some of these large tech companies and Stanley Druckenmiller, and no one has a better track record as a hedge fund manager over the last 30 or 40 years than Druckenmiller. I mean, he was in NVIDIA, I think, late 2021. He was, he was doing public interviews talking about artificial intelligence stocks in NVIDIA then. So he's been taking profits and rotating into what cheaper commodities, oil companies, base metal miners, gold miners. So I think he's thinking that it, I, I don't know the exact timing, but six, 12 months uh, time frame, give or take, he's thinking that things could play out similar to the tech bubble, where once those technology stocks did crash, uh, where there was a macro event, I don't know, the Fed cuts rates, panics, there's a commercial real estate crisis, 
the dollar rallies and then creates a global margin call. Who knows? There's a bunch of other factors there. And then there's a U.S. stock market crash and then gold bottoms and then takes off again. So I think he's kind of playing that. Yeah, he has talked about that, though, a lot. So his um, tactical trades, are very, which are, are very highly concentrated, are very different from his macro calls. I do listen to most all of his interviews, actually, and he's been calling for recession. He's been, you know, he's been dollar short. All the very, very realistic reasons to worry about the government's ability to fund itself um, and create um, real growth, not that nominal top line growth just from, you know, lots of spending. So he's all right. <laughs> I mean, everything that he says is right. But when does the market actually care? He's been wrong about that. So the timing of the macro triggers to upend this market advance, um, he has not nailed. But And his oil calls. But his NVIDIA concentration risk, 100% he nailed. So it's it's one of those where a lot of macro managers get um, uh, focused on a particular philosophy, right? And they're right, but it, the market still has this innate ability to, to still depend on the Fed put. And now we've got, again, I love to refer to it as the Yellen Yahtzee. She's going to roll the dice right now for um, April 30th. How will she fund the growing fiscal spending? Will it be you know, more T-bills, shorter duration? Or will this time have a, a bigger composition of notes and, and a longer duration bonds? Uh, last time she did that on April 1st, we ended up having a pullback for three months because it was more bonds than bills. Um, and then we had November 1st, it was more bills than bonds, and we had a big, huge rally. So all that stuff is is now um, carefully analyzed. <laughs> it used to be an unknown, and now we're right, like analysts are right on it. They're talking about it in market watch of all places. So it's very interesting how we've gotten much more educated about the triggers and it all comes down, in my opinion, to a macro trigger we need and the um, the option flow. As long as it continues to be uh, bullish, they're buying calls and selling puts, then um, we have a, a, a potential for a actual melt up. And there's about 10 trillion, I think, in U.S. Treasury debt that has to be right, refinanced, rolled over in the next 12 months. So you're not worried then at all about this divergence between the uh, S&P 500 or NASDAQ 100 versus the small cap indexes then? Well, I am because um, it, it well, depends. First of all, the small cap, the Russell 2000 has, uh, you know, a good 30, 40 percent of dead weight, right? Unprofitable zombies affectionately referred to as, you know, um, left for dead. So that's the interesting part that what the Russell 1000 actually takes the better companies. So if they're doing their job right, they've actually migrated from the you know the Russell 2000 to the Russell 1000 and then you know those are a, a lot better off. So you can cherry pick within those plays I think have a better chance of coming up off the bottom in kind of an everything rally. Uh we've seen a huge um start to that actually where uh, both retail names and biotech names and select um, um, uh, tech and select small caps have done extremely well this month. And tech has gone sideways. You can look at a chart of NASDAQ and we're kind of, we're correcting in time, not price. We've gone sideways. So the, the, the mega cap tech or MAG7 is, you know, whittled down to 6543. The point is they're petering out, but they're hardly correcting, right? I mean, in other words, the market is overbought, but not broken. And the, the growth plays have absolutely softened, giving value, for lack of a better word, a chance to kind of catch up. I definitely see more of that. So I see more of the, the, the oversold value plays, select ones, of course, um, continuing to move higher. I have a trend long only portfolio for clients. I have Chase Swing and Trend, and that is mostly all uh, value names and cyclical, you know, strength, best stocks and the best sectors, and they're all tied to assets. So it's not necessarily always going to be an earnings um, play. It's going to be uh, you know, stocks that are tied uh, heavily to things because in an inflationary backdrop, that's that's very beneficial. And I don't think inflation is going away. So I'm I'm definitely much more on the on the side of structural inflation. So I like things basically to um, perform over paper. 
So not so interested in bonds. And in fact, every chance I get, um, I short the rip in bonds. So long story short, I think that those have done not only exceptionally well, granted, I didn't have the concentration risk in that trend portfolio, but the point is there has there's just no lack of performance. We're still in great stocks, in great value plays. We're breaking out in all-time highs. Oh my gosh, even, you know, waste management and, and a whole bunch of other names that you never, ever, ever, ever look at that are boring um, are breaking out in similar patterns to NVIDIA. It's like they're in parabolas. So money is coming in and because they don't want the tech concentration risk, right? We're already at 98% exposure or percentile um, for hedge funds that um, are, are long this tech concentration risk. They're di They're diversifying. And they're buying up everything, not everything, but the best of breed um, in other sectors that are absolutely crushing it, both because they are, um, you know, they're economically tied and the economy is doing fine, whether it be the consumer um, or the infrastructure bill, right, that one and a half trillion, it doesn't matter. They're actually doing really, really well. So I think there's just too much focus on the big tech. There's too much focus on NVIDIA and SMCI. It's fascinating, but the rest of the world really is not paying attention to that. They're kind of looking at their um, 401ks and saying, you know, this is actually, we're doing okay here. So they're not worried yet. We're, we don't have a macro trigger yet. We're going to get one. It will have a nice correction, but I don't see this as a big um, uh, 1999 yet. I still see this as potential that this could be 1995. Business media is just talking up like Bitcoin, NVIDIA. So they're cheerleading the stocks that are and the the uh, crypto that's already going up. So they're cheerleading, trying to pump them higher. It's just kind of ridiculous at this point. But to add to your points there, I, I think like the real economy with the consumer spending and also like the asset prices and the asset price inflation, I don't think there's going to be a lot of deflation allowed long term. Uh, the goal is asset price inflation, the Cantillon effect. There's a... Yep the real economy is bifurcated because some of the data we're getting out, I mean, there's a, a bunch of new millionaires now from their yeah. stock portfolio. And yet, it's good for tax revenue. <laughs> <laughs> well, same for home prices too. Home prices, despite mortgages where they are, home prices haven't really gone down in many markets. So this is interesting. And I think this is, um, so I have several on my trading desk, right? So I actually have um, a very full trading desk of 10 contributors. Uh, one is a macro hedge fund manager, and, and he runs our edge product. And Jeffrey is a classical economist, and he's part of the edge product as well. And he's the one who has really studied fiscal dominance the most. And he had this funny quote. He said, disinflation is not possible in fiscal dominance. It's not a thing. The only way to stop inflation is a fiscal plan. So... I'm actually bullish housing and I have been during all of the COVID during like clients know this. It doesn't there's an inflationary backdrop, things over paper with wages going up, the replacement cost of your house is <laughs> so expensive and the yields right on mortgages is 7%. It's just the building. They had a backlog, but the whole nature of inflationary assets holding their value um, is actually a big deal. So you, you just were talking about housing. I was I was switching gears on you and talking about fiscal dominance. But the point is, it's still very much a um, a, a supportive structure for why uh, asset uh, focused, literally asset focused assets um, are are going to still do well. And it's, if the speculative stuff is going to be under assault as soon as yields start to move higher. So think about what happens to Bitcoin when uh, the tenure gets back to 5% and starts moving higher. Do you think it can succumb that? It, you know, that it, it can withheld, withhold their, you know, the, the sellers um, of, of, especially the new ones, first in, right, um, are going to are gonna be absolutely last in or they're going to be the first out, I should say, because we use it as a trading vehicle versus the very, 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 very few that have a lot of it. So to me, as soon as we get up, you know, into this 4.7, 5% and above in the 10 year, we're going to see a very different backdrop to these speculative assets. So right now they're making hot, they're, they're 
easily manipulated. Again, tons of FOMO, but how sustainable will it be once we get above a five year, uh, 5% and a 10 year? And especially if the dollar rallies, but a, a lot of it depends on emerging market currencies. So if the emerging market currencies are collapsing against the dollar, I mean, people who have savings in those emerging market currencies are going to want to get out of their domestic currency. So they're, like I said, we're back to a lot of different macro cross currents. Uh, fiscal dominance, is that like yield curve control and Japanification or is that something different? It's a little bit different. Um, <laughs> it's really, but they will try yield curve control. I mean, there's definitely the um, the focus on fiscal deficits as the primary reason for inflation. And there's nothing really that is going to change our um, uh Hold on just a second. Um, our trajectory until we can get control of this fiscal spending. So it's when literally the monetary policy loses its effect. So Fed right now really isn't running things. Yellen, because of all the fiscal spending, has to issue right all of 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 this um, these these bills and bonds in order to fund the government. So it's much more important. They work in cahoots, I know, but the point is that's really critical. So our obvious rise in, in fiscal deficits is creating much more monetary financing. So now it's not obvious, but Yellen is actually a little polit politicized, right? So what she does in the composition of this funding right before an election also matters to market returns. So we're not, I'm not expecting any big interruption until we get through the um, the election. But this is a big deal because this whole uh, money creation that has occurred, in other words, they printed a whole bunch after covid and loose monetary policy and continued fiscal spending, it has created this um, now dependency where we are default a little bit at a time. We have to inflate our way out of this um, rising deficit backdrop because the alternative would be full default, right? We can either grow our way out of it, we can default, I think the plan right now is a slow default, little by little, so it's not so obvious. But ultimately, the only way we're going to control inflation is through, um, you know, control of the of the debt of the fiscal spending. Oh, I see. So, so uh, rather than an immediate default, which is a technical technical default, like an emerging market would say, okay, we can't pay our bonds. The currency crashes. The bonds like just basically blow up. They're just going to inflate the debt away in nominal value over time. With so that is a little hyperbolic, but it is basically the higher policy rates, right? In this back, the regime that we're in right now, uh, are required. The, the, the demands for term premium are higher, right? By the by the bondholders, and then this higher policy rate feeds the inflation and the inflation expectations. So, what are it? You know, how do we do this? Um, what are what are the the skills that this developed market of of America has with fiscal dominance? We don't have it. Emerging markets are used to it. They're they're used to kind of the the monetary um, uh, getting uh, swamped with corruption and you know um, budgets out of control. We don't have really any mechanism here for the public to understand how this operates and the effect on the devaluation of the dollar and the loss of basically confidence in the U.S. Treasury, which makes it harder to, to kind of stuff those bonds onto foreign country central banks, right? You've already seen the pushback, Japan and, and, and China. Japan says no more and China says we're getting out of this. Um, we basically, but they got one trillion, so it's not like they can turn on a dime that would hurt them. We don't have, you know, a lot of private industry, pensions and otherwise, jumping in to get more on their balance sheet, banks as well, 
because of the unrealized losses that exist, even though we know what happened in March of last year, Fed, Treasury, White House, they've all said, don't worry about it. We're going to make it at par. You got, Don't worry about it, right? But the reality is it's still there. <laughs> oh, you mean losses on Treasury bonds like the duration risk that Silicon Valley Bank had? Because I, I would argue it's, that the... Exactly, exactly. But this is across the board. This is pensions, this is banks, this is, right? Insurance companies too, yeah. In, my major, major insurance companies. So that's what I mean by we have... Um, this kind of ignorance is bliss. Don't look over there, right? We're going to monetize this. And they have. They well, basically... think... Go you ahead. Mon monetize the what, the debt? Or what monetize what? Slowly, this is, in other words, not letting this uh, extreme condition appear, which would undermine the faith and confidence in the U.S. Treasury market, which is the most important market in the world. So they come in and they backstop those unrealized losses because the alternative is we turn into an emerging market overnight. And I think that uh, these um, unrealized losses, I think they're even worse for commercial real estate. I mean, like some of the stuff I'm seeing just to avoid default, you're seeing pension funds, insurance companies sell some of these office buildings for, uh, I think one of them in New York City, a trophy one just sold for a dollar. Well, they they I, I did see that one. And it, there's a little bit more devil in the details. They did pass it on to Boston Consulting Group. And, you know, so there are deals that, to get out of the debt that they have. And then, of course, it's assumed by the buyer. But the point is, yes, CRE needs time to repair. And it needs a lot of time to repair. So that was another kind of backstop. Um, and right now, the economy is, again, seemingly uh, doing better with ability to let these um, entities basically get picked off, right? So what is the um, the group that came out and said, uh, we're starting a fund. It's a big one. You'd know it. David Rubenstein, I think his name. Um, Carlisle fund, Group. Right? Yeah. He just bought the Orioles. Okay. So he started just recently, raised a whole bunch of money. Guess what? They're going in to go and get these commercial real estate deals because they know how to make money off of those who are in you know, bad straits. <laughs> so there are there are opportunities. There will always be opportunities as long as it doesn't all crash at once. There's well, still a lot of money out there. And their private equity or a VC money, two trillion dollars. They've done nothing with that money since two twenty since twenty twenty one when we have this, you know, massive influx of IPOs, uh, you know, the SPACs and all of that drama. It has been a very quiet market. They came back down to earth, they splat. They were splat. Some of them went out of business. Some of them went private. Some of them got acquired and the rest of them became irrelevant. And they've been sitting there for a few years. That money is waiting to come back in and cherry pick. So that's what I mean by Fed and Treasury and, and the rest. The policies, even at the White House, are allowing for the market to repair so CRE doesn't become a flaming inferno. So that unrealized treasury losses on insurance and pension and all these other balance sheets, banks, doesn't become a, a flaming inferno. They've actually done a good job of putting out, I don't even want to put, I don't even want to say putting out the fire, but um, uh, managing the spread of the fire. Well, I've spoken with bankers and they basically told me this is similar to 2005, 2006 and 2007 all over again. So they bought time for the last 12 months. But uh, I know hedge fund managers that are shorting some of this stuff in commercial real estate. So they they still think it'll play out in the next year or two. We'll see what happens. Well, I'm basically expecting that we're going to have a slow devaluation of the dollar and that Treasury and Treasuries. So both. Um, not that we have as much juice to squeeze out of the, the bond short or the dollar short, but the fact that it will be a slow devaluation of the dollar and treasuries, it'll be a slow drip by drip default, as I was mentioning, um, in, in this uh, US government debt. And that basically, unfortunately, all of it translates to more fiscal spending. And this is, you know, again, on top of the already 3 trillion in excess money supply that we already have post COVID, that is going into assets, speculative and real, right? Paper and things. <laughs> so that's basically, I don't want to, you know, um, just be, what do you call it? A blind bull. There are many blind bulls. They think they're brilliant because 
you know, they went into SMCI at the right point or Bitcoin, but that's FOMO. It's speculative. It's not sustainable, but it is absolutely profitable. And hats off. There are lots of ma- ways to make money. The trick is not to lose it. My interest is look is kind of pulling back and saying, okay, I want to size up where the market's going, where the where's the money rotating, what are the best stocks, what's you know, and then cross referencing the macro triggers, which are dollar yields and oil. And right now, those are all quote unquote stable, but all three of them are also slowly fading. And that's what's giving that that kind of suppression or that devaluation or that fading of dollar yields and and oil is also helping to support the equities market here and abroad. I mean, Japan, the Nikkei just hit its, you know, 1989 high and the the DAX. Oh, my goodness. They're in an industrial recession, but they're still, you know, gangbusters in their equities market. It's just relative to the devaluation that's happening, I believe, in the real um, instruments of you know currency and treasury. So I know you also do swing trades, which are kind of yes. not short-term trading or day trading. Are there any specific sectors or industries where you think the fundamentals are improving and the stock valuations on those companies are drastically mispriced and there's good opportunities, risk versus reward for a swing trade, say, over the next 6, 12, 18 months? Yeah, so I actually, I, I differentiate the time frame. So chases can be, right, because I run a live trading room. So anything that moves and usually lasts a few days, um, you know, this is all very adrenaline focused and market um, news uh, kind of driven. But swings are definitely my bread and butter. I really like to size up when volatility is going to come into an instrument uh, and then directionally position for that using mostly options. And then obviously kind of identify the um, uh, the direction. The direction is one thing, but the intensity of the move and the duration of a move. So right now, I and that's, by the way, very separate from the trends. The trends are um, what I call multi-month versus swings are kind of multi-week. They can turn into multi-month and they oftentimes do trends. They start out as a multi-month and they, tur- they turn into years if they're if they're working, as long as they're working and nothing's changed. But on the swing time frame, I am looking very much at this new theme. I started talking about it in mid-January. I doubled down again in February where these oversold IPOs are going to start to percolate um, up in interest. VC money is also going to come back into the space. Um, uh, Part of that is also the biotech. Biotech loves loose monetary policy or QE and speculation. And like I said, we still have a lot of it, right? So instead of, you know, chasing Bitcoin at all time highs, there is a great, um, uh, amazing advance that we literally got positioned for in, again, oversold retail, IPOs, biotech, and it has been hot fire flames. It's been phenomenal. So when I broaden out and kind of look at these kind of debt addicted companies um, that everyone is discarding because they're in that Russell 2000, for example, guess what? In the, For the first time in over two decades, it is now cheaper to sell shares than issue debt. And that is very supportive for um, you know, money to come back into this space, I believe, for shares of companies to be um, offered up instead of their you know, continued need and refinancing of debt because debt's now extremely precious um, you know, to qualify for, right? So I'm just kind of looking at big picture, pulling back. The companies that are going to be doing that are going to be um, in a in a kind of a sweet spot, I think, for um, advancement. And then, of course, the whole space of speculation has kind of left a lot of these oversold plays um, alone. And I think that they're going to start to come up off the ground. And we'll see it when we see the short covering rally type of thing, like Carvana. Carvana was um, a bet into earnings uh, positioned actually in mid-February saying, I think this is really time that they're going to announce and it could fundamentally trigger a short covering rally. And, you know, it was up, you know, a good 58% after earnings. Why? Because it has a lot of shorts and it can continue higher. And, you know, insiders came in and started buying and Apollo did some debt financing. But the point is, it's it's been down on the ground for three years. For good reason, by the way. 
But these are the types of plays that are popping up and uh, they look like they're not done. So the combination of ultra low rates, you know, that help these companies get indebted. And now that it's literally a, 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 a I don't even want to call it, but a, a, a 20 year change where they can actually go to market and uh, sell equity. I think that it's just it's it's a great time to be involved in some select plays um, that uh, will kind of navigate around a higher rate uh, backdrop. So those biotech companies and post-type IPO companies that crashed a couple of years ago and are starting to rally again, those companies oh, yeah. have cash flow. So those aren't like the yes. Silicon Valley unicorns that all they would do is, oh, we have a PowerPoint presentation. Oh, we have our own metrics. Oh, we're going to hoping to get some revenue or profits years from now, and we're just going to sell shares. So those types of companies that don't have like profits and stuff, they're not getting the funding. You're talking about companies that actually have cash flow and stuff that want to sell some equity instead of debt. This is very, exactly. And in fact, in the biotech space, you can kind of... I, I'm very fortunate that we have um, a doctor in the house, you know, on our trader, um, a trading bench. He's a biopharma analyst uh, and and trader. So his specialty is understanding the science, but also being able to do the fundamental uh, research um, around the management, the business opportunity and the revenue streams. And he's exactly focused on that. So the ones that are actually you know, that just have. I'm talking about biotech in this particular uh, situation, the ones that have kind of demonstrated that they have alternative revenue streams, you know, not just a successful therapy are the ones that absolutely are the ones getting bid up. Like we can see it. Like he has a list. Right? <laughs> these are the speculative ones. You know, these these may not have um, a successful therapy, but they they have the sponsorship. Um, it, these have a successful therapy. These have a successful therapy and a revenue stream, and you can absolutely see where the money is going. It's it's really obvious. So there there is a, an intelligent community out there that is seeing some opportunities. Um, and why DKTX, for example. Uh, which is, you know, this weight loss drug alternative to Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk came out with their trial and it was beautiful, right? And it screamed higher 100 and, I don't know, 76%, but it had a really good reason to do so. He already knew that. We were already positioned for that. So there's a way to go in and find the companies that are best of breed. They may not be NVIDIA, right? But but they're in a different, there are lots and lots of players right now that are very viable alternatives, I'm just saying. Sounds like the market's being a lot more selective than it was in the past under zero interest rate yes. policy for about 15 years. Because back then, like, if you had a halfway decent PowerPoint and you were talking about, oh, we're going to have growth for this or that, I mean, you could raise capital. It was a lot easier back then. They threw money at almost everything. Look how much money we were raised. Exactly. So this is <laughs> your point is well taken. And I think they're being, um, uh, you know, more selective for lots of reasons, higher cost of funding, um, but also what happened in 2021 and the, uh, you know, the moonshot that literally came back down to earth and has been sitting there uh, waiting for something totally wicked awesome to happen three years so I think this is just a slow thing, right? It comes out of a base and then it starts to work higher versus going after the ones that have already done the moonshot like an SMCI. Okay, as we wrap up here, one, one more question about commodities. Do you see commodities then going sideways or in a bear market? Or do you think that the bottom is going to be in the next 6, 12, 18 months like Stanley Druckmiller is predicting? So, yeah, um, Drack Miller went in and bought some Newmont before they reported earnings. He should have waited until after. <laughs> but, <laughs> yeah, that um, was terrible. One it was terrible earnings, timing. I but um, honestly, I like um, gold, you know, as just boring store of value. Silver has industrial purpose and it really doesn't do much. I mean, I'm not looking at both of those until we have a real big fall in the dollar. But I do look at miners, not as a trading vehicle at all right now because they're not in play. Um, and again, gold does like loose monetary policy when it first comes out, but then not so much after that. Real rates start to catch up to it. But for the most part, um, gold miners are kind of this spread between inflation and deflation. And right now we're we're kind of working that out, right? We've, we, we have real compounding inflation of things the way that all of us know bills have gone up. 
but the rate of change has fallen. And the cost also of the um, the mining activities, et cetera, is all very makes it very complicated for the for the gold miner space. It also is kind of tied into what's happening with um, oil and the production and supply demand and the productivity gains that have made been made there, which I believe is also there's no interest in really um, driving oil higher. So I'm not a big bull as it relates to precious metals, unless we have a really big fall in the dollar. I'm not a big bull as it relates to oil. Um, at least right now, we've we've every every pop has been sold. Um, as it relates to you know food, very much we've had compounding food inflation, but that's very hard for retail to trade. Uh, cocoa, by the way, if you put a chart of cocoa next in the video, they're exact fractals. I mean, it's absolutely parabolic. So, but that is just a sign of inflation. If you look at industrial commodities, that is very much focused on supply demand. So in other words, a lot of folks will bring out the uh, the Bloomberg Commodity Index and say, look, it's been falling. No, that's not how you measure inflation. That's, you know, it's been falling and so inflation is falling. Nope, that's not how you measure it. Because commodities are cyclical. There's so much tied to supply and demand. Um, a lot can be front ordered. You know, it's all cyclical. It's not a really great tell. Food is a much, much, much better tell of inflation. And miners are the spread between inflation and deflation. Anyway, long story short, they're very hard for most retail to trade. <laughs> so um, as it relates to this year, I think, uh, obviously, you know, the end of the year, I have a particular price target on the 10-year, which is much higher. So I do think, uh, and I've said this when we last talked, I think it was like November or whatever, um, that we would kind of first few quarters of this year, I think the 10 years is just going to snake around. It's not going to be really impactful. It's not going to drive inflation expectations, et cetera, et cetera. I could be wrong if we get one of these macro triggers, but for right now, um, it's really just not in the way of the equity advance. At the end of the year, I see it rising higher, right? So above 5%, we could even tag six and a half percent. So that's the, 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 the trigger oftentimes for commodities and yields to trade in sync. Um, but I don't see that as a, a near-term risk. So I see it more toward the end of the year. Uh, okay, in the meantime, so there's lots of other, you know, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just, there's, there's lots of other um, it, more interesting sectors than um, commodities per se. Okay, I just wanted to make sure, clarify that you still are in, because I think the last time I interviewed you, November, around November, that you were talking about a long-term bond bear market. So you're still in that camp, but you're saying that it could, they could temporarily oh, yeah. bring yields down if there's what, a banking panic or something like that. They could bring yields down temporarily, but you still expect a big spike in the 10 years treasury, what, over the next 12 months or 18 months, something like that? Oh, yeah. So we came down from that, you know, 5%. I had a Basically, I figured we would go to 4%. We overshot to 3.8%. I do not see us getting below 3.5% for a long, 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 long time. So I, I just don't see, again, like what, like Jeffrey said, right? There's no such thing as deflation in fiscal dominance. Just not possible. <laughs> so, um, and I think the rates right now are way masking what they should be. So um, I think they would be higher if they could be. Uh, but we obviously that's just not allowed. We can't have too high a dollar or yield or oil. It would upset upset the apple cart, uh, literally, of equities and the economy. Um, and so we're not going to have it until after the election. It won't be allowed to roam <laughs> until after the election. Well, also, if the dollar rallies, dollar index rallies too much, it's a global margin call on like euro dollar, all the derivatives tied to the dollar. Yeah. So like the average person doesn't understand this. If the dollar starts to rally too much, like the call that Brent Johnson for the dollar milkshake, I mean, if dollar index goes to 120 or higher, I mean, I think he said 150 at some point. I mean, that would collapse the banking system and a lot of emerging yeah, so markets. I'm, I'm on the other side of that trade. I think the U.S. dollar has likely peaked. So even in a risk-off scenario, in fiscal dominance, you just don't have that same rotation. So this is unfortunately the, the monetary dominance mindset when the milkshake theory was created. And it was brilliant. And I followed it and I loved it. And it's just, but it's done. So in fiscal dominance, this, the, the, the 
the the dollar milkshake cannot exist. Well, I mean, you get many ones. You get some flight capital here, but yet they can't yes, have that many. dollar. They can't have the dollar super spike because it collapses everything. So I, I think what the Fed, the Treasury, what they want, they want it like a managed dollar, or slow devaluation over time. They try to keep the dollar in like a trading range. Correct. So. Yes, I agree with you there. <laughs> so th this is what I mean by a um, a slow devaluation of the dollar, a slow devaluation of of treasuries, and um, honestly, a, a slow default. Um, you know, drip by drip, because it beats the alternative. But a spiking higher dollar, mm, that's really tough. I, I just don't see that anymore. Um, unless, unless we were to get, uh, we would definitely have an, an excursion of higher dollar on peace, right? So every time we get peace, it's very dollar bullish. If we were to have fiscal control, that would also be very dollar bullish. I mean, th there are definitely reasons where we would turn and and move higher. But right now, you know, given that we are solidly in fiscal dominance, um, betting on the dollar to go higher or betting on stocks going lower nominally is just not going to work. And especially when the dollar 2019, 2020, it started dollar index started to about to break out. I mean, DC just changed the rules. The Fed, the Treasury, they create all those liquidity programs, currency swap lines. I mean, they they knew uh, around the repo crisis 2019, they knew that if the dollar kept rallying, I mean, there was like going to be bankruptcies for foreign banks and sovereign debt defaults on dollar denominated debt. They knew this stuff was going to happen. They learned this. So they kind of panic when the dollar rallies too much. They don't want it too high or too low. They kind of keep it in the trading range. Uh, there's tons of rules. Yeah, there's not free markets in the <laughs> currency nope. change rate. Nope, there aren't. I, I, I don't know if we call them. I'm, I'm not upset about that. I'm just saying it beats the alternative, right? Um, but more importantly, I think it, they have guardrails. So I think we're kind of, uh, you know, they kind of treat us as children or, you know, we're, we're, we're driving near a cliff and they don't want us to go over, however you want to put it. For right now, by the way, that's actually very safe. That's why I can say the things that I say about a bullish backdrop. Now, imagine, just imagine, we get a new sheriff in town and all the policies that we have grown to become very familiar with, Right. Are, are removed. So, you know, this is a big risk that we're not able to size up yet, but it is very much why the market continues to run higher is because we know the policies under Biden if, if he gets reelected, right? We kind of know what would happen with Trump too, but we don't know if it would be somebody else. So, you know, until we get that kind of confirmation, we definitely have um, risk, but uh, it's unknown. So the market is just climbing climbing that wall of worry, as they like to say. But I will say the inflation, uh, you know, uh, let's just say control that we were just talking about, right? I call it guardrails. Um, but that report card is, is a good one so far, right? They, they've come out to do what they wanted to do. The White House maintained loose immigration policies and a tight energy price control, and that kept inflation in check. We had labor slack, you know, made up by lots of foreign-born uh, nationals. The cost of higher yields, big deal. Fed stepped down its rate hiking regime in March of 2023 after that bank crisis and paused right, at the end of 2023, and now they're pulling forward rate cuts into 2024, what happens? The cost of yields, the kind of the, the bond market corrects itself. And all that cost of, of fiscal spending, that's all right on the squarely on the backs of the Treasury. They are tasked with monetizing that growing fiscal deficit. And they also issue those U.S. dollar swaps that you talked about, right, with other bank and with the foreign central banks and bank facilities, that is keeping the largest market in the world liquid and flowing. So we can continue, nothing's seizing up, right? Liquidity is just another well, word that, for that news. That news story I talked about, uh, that came out like a couple weeks ago, I mentioned it a little bit ago in the interview where the US and China are sitting down preventing emerging market sovereign debt defaults. So it sounds like they're doing something like that too. Exactly, to exactly. And I was just gonna say, so, so far, as long as we have well-coordinated efforts with the Fed, with the with U.S. banks, central global bank, central banks, with with Congress and White House, right? I mean, we're talking trench. As long as all this is coordinated, and you know how tight we are with Bank of Japan, 
And if they're sitting down with PBOC, then you know that everything's going to be okay. It's when that, I don't mean, you know, in the sense of we have a lot broken, but you know what I mean. It, it's it's going to continue to support the economic and equity backdrop. If any of that changes, policies, players, governments become unfriendly, then I take that all back. <laughs> well, I've, I've been it's part of my stack flight te- tax life th- thesis. There's a lot of rules changes and bailouts, and um, there's a lot of lawyers here in the DC metro area. So they like pulling the levers and changing the rules, and that's what you get. So they're aware that like a dollar super spike that that could collapse the system, that'll trigger foreign banks and sovereign debt default. So that's why you're seeing all these headlines about uh, them sitting down and negotiating because they don't want um, crashes and collapses and stuff like that causing contagion. Yeah, and that's it. And then so as long as we ha- they've done a good job so far of making sure that the, both the equity and the bond markets have been supported, which in my estimation is akin to quantitative quantitative easing. So if if anything changes, um, you know that's what we look for. That's the macro event risk that we're always looking for. That's going to uh, you know make um, for a bigger um, uh, pullback or correction. But um, they so far have administ- have orchestrated kind of a no landing by intervening in every area they can to control and or influence the cost of inflation. Yep. Just look at the BTFP when uh, all those other regional banks were in trouble. They at least delayed things another 12 months because I think what Silicon Valley Bank, it's around 12 months from now uh, when uh, 12 months ago when uh, the BTFP and the Silicon Valley Bank happened and they prevented a lot of the other contagion. Correct. So there, that, that's what we're basically the market is betting on is that they will continue to intervene. So the thing to look for is, of course, if we have a, a change in um, players or in politics between nations um, and then, of course, policies. So that's what I look for. But otherwise, the market's bullish from a, you know, a, a chase swing. Well, chase can go either way. But right now it is swing bullish and trend bullish. Um, but again, if we get a, 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 a PCEs tomorrow, we might have you know some volatility that's short term. We've got CPI coming up, non-farm payrolls coming up, FOMC coming up. We always have a, a you know event driven risk, but big picture, it is a shake and bake until we can have a macro trigger to actually reverse this trend. The trend right now is overbought but not broken. And there's flight capital coming to the U.S. So unless there's like a crash or banking exactly. system implosion, it sounds like it would come maybe out of Europe with commercial real estate or European banks with a dollar rally or China. So it sounds like those could be larger risk factors than what the stuff going on in the U.S. with the liquidity programs and the D.C. spending. Yeah, I don't know where it comes from. Um, just as long as uh, we can kind of smell it first, we'll see it in FX. Usually we'll see it in currency moves which then bleeds over into the bond markets, literally the move index, the volatility of uh, treasuries. And then we then see it in equities. So equities are actually the, 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 the last. So we can see it first for those who are looking. That's my job. I want to thank you so much for your time today, Samantha. I really appreciate it. If my listeners want to check out your swing trading service for some of those good small caps that are making money right now, how do they do so? I have a website, LaDukeTrading.com, and I'm actually not alone. Like I said, I literally have 10 contributors from macro to micro, um, stock options, you name it, and beginner, intermediate, advanced. So we really try to serve all masters and uh, all assets. So um, I would definitely invite you to check us out. I I also have a live trading room and portfolios for the positions. Um, And in addition, I have a Substack product just launched in January at Samantha LaDuke. So it's LaDukeTrading.com at Samantha LaDuke. And of course, you can catch me on Twitter. Um, and I'm, you know, post there on occasion. And we uh, get a whole bunch of, I do more macro on that channel. But um, this is great discussion. I'm always impressed so much, Jason, with your just knowledge of the macro and the, the fundamental take your uh, persistence in this industry. We talked, you know, prior, you've been doing this for a while. You do it really well. You've got loyal listeners and I appreciate their time. Uh, Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Yeah, we didn't even get to talk about gold stocks. Uh, There's some really, for oil stocks, for listeners out there, there's profitable oil companies, gold companies, they're selling at 
50% discount to book value or net asset value. Right now, the market just doesn't care about them. Some of these companies have like free cash flow, 6% dividend yields. There's good bargains there for people who are patient and just want to buy and hold those. 100%. I, that's why I say these are more of the asset plays than earnings plays. They're not momentum. But as uh, Warren Buffett said brilliantly in, in, in one of his, you know, uh, acquisition, um, not acquisition, um, talks, I think maybe he was even speaking about Oxy. I'm not quite sure where he's, you know, got a, a position of size. He said, I, I don't plan to become super rich owning energy. I plan to stay super rich owning <laughs> energy. <laughs> Well, have you seen any of the um, projections if artificial intelligence investments in the next like six to 10 years start to pay off with all these data centers? I mean, the electricity usage that some of these uh, agencies are projecting is insane globally. Yeah, and he's going to want a position for some of that. I mean, he did really well in uh, Texas with the the grid issues. I'm sure there, there'll be some select um, plays there. They've got tons of cash, but I honestly don't know... Um, the, the the plays right now that he's considering or how to even position for them. The one that I was very excited about was Japan. So um, I didn't know until April of last year that Buffett had gone into Japan, actually starting in 2019, but then very, very heavily in the summer of 2020 and basically issued a whole bunch of debt in uh, yen. In fact, he became the largest issuer of debt in yen among all the companies that issued debt that year. It was fascinating. Anyway, He's the doing macro? That, oh, Buffett's doing macro now. That's oh, my God. He did macro. And I didn't even know this. Until, uh, literally, I did research and didn't find out about it until April. And I did a Yahoo Finance interview. And I called it, you know, the Buffett bet, where he basically took positions in five trading houses, which was very, by the way, um, nuanced and slow because he had to get the confidence and he took a small uh, percentage, and then he has grown that um, over time. But these are commodity houses. You were talking about commodities, right? And he, he basically made the bet that um, the negative rate interest uh, that BOJ had stuck to in their yield curve control uh, would be forced higher because of inflation. He was dead right, right? I mean, absolutely spot on. And that the commodity uh, trading houses would benefit their gatekeepers, Right. And so he was basically making a huge investment um, in rising yields, rising inflation and uh, commodities, things. So I didn't realize that until April. I'm like, oh, my God, I love this bet. So I basically put on a, a trend long for clients, which was Japan. Um, and Japan ended up that was a, a perfect time um, for that big move, because you've seen what's happened with the Nikkei. And there are lots of instruments to trade for retail. And then I also added Toyota back in June of 2023, and that was on the same kind of theme that they would uh, not only do well as a proxy for Japan, but that they were more focused on hybrids versus these battery electric vehicle, you know, companies um, that were popping up like Daisy in, uh, in Daisy's in China, and of course Tesla. So it was really kind of the other side of of uh, a pair trade of Tesla short. So anyway, long story short, the, the Buffett bet on Japan, he literally recently said it was one of my top three trading I, uh, positions ever. So this is a man who's what, 93? He literally said of all the all the trades I have ever placed, you know, businesses, I've gotten deals, whatever you want to call it. This was one of my top three in my life. I think he's looking at Korea now, too. He's been looking at Korean conglomerates, too. So, yeah, he is looking at Asia for value. Yep. So that's it. He basically, um, he got in there early. I didn't realize it until April, um, but then it ended up being a really solid theme uh, by Japan. And then in June, um, it was value rotation and, and hybrids by Toyota. So that actually ended up working really well. And right now my focus is more on, like I said, I don't want to call it the everything rally, but the stuff that has been languishing, that's still good, not junk, um, but that has potential from the IPO or the retail or the you know biotech space. Um, that has been some really good fishing um, the past month, and I think it's going to continue this year.